22 часа 28 минут. Масса... World's longest opening. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> ten second version. Maybe the ten second version of that. Uh, welcome to Space Vidcast 515 for whatever day it is, 2012. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me, as always, is a beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham. We've been off for a while, so we're going to jump straight into it. Um, because we've been off for a while, there are a bunch of launches we missed, and we've got video coverage of all that, so we're going to show you those. Um, but in addition, Endeavor is making her final journey. This is her final mission uh, going from Kennedy Space Center over here to the California Science Museum. And you had an opportunity to go to the National, NASA Social event. So I, I figured we did. open the show talking about, for those who've never heard of NASA Social or don't know what it is, um, talk about a little bit what your experience was like and then how people can get involved with that. Sure. Um, so NASA Social is the rebranded Tweet Ups. Um, so NASA wanted to sort of open up everything. Uh, tweet Ups have been going so well that they decided that they wanted to include more people than just the people who were on Twitter. Uh, they wanted to include all social media, so they've been calling it NASA Social. So if you're involved in Facebook or Google+, Twitter, um, all those sorts of things, then you could put your name into the grand old hat, as it were, uh, to different socials that are either in your area or sometimes not in your area. We had people coming way from further away from like the East Coast and whatnot. Uh, DJ Flux came all the way over from Ohio. Uh, so that was really cool. Uh, we at this particular NASA social was up at the Dryden Center in, um, a little bit north of here. And it was really cool. Uh, the, the thing, the funny thing to me is that normally we're on the media, the proper press media side we're, of we're things. We're proper press. Well, you know, as proper as we it get is, and all. It is what it is. And, um, you know, uh, my, my, only, my only experience has been at Kennedy Space Center being media part with that. And at best you get a room so you get some air conditioning and you're out of the sun and you get a desk and a chair. Mm-hmm. And that, that's, that's basically all that's provided. And you need to pay a lot of money for bandwidth. <laughs> yes. For really bad bandwidth from at and Yes, and yes. But the, the Tweet Up people, the previously called Tweet Up people, got a really nice tent in air conditioning oh, and they yeah, were well, outside we were and totally they had speakers them. that came in and they were like, hey, and if, you know, if something got delayed, which it always did, it was like, you know what, why don't we just take you guys into the VAB? I never got into the VAB. I still haven't been in the VAB. All those sorts of things. So I was really excited for this because I was like, finally, Finally, you, I'm going to be one of those people. You're one of the cool kids. I am, and so, I, so I totally what was, it? was. So great. So what was it? What, what did you do? Um, so we got to tour all over Dryden. Uh, we got to meet all different kinds of people. I mean, I, I'm not going to go into absolutely everything, but we talked to engineers, and we talked to guys who make tools, and uh, we talked to flight directors, and we talked to just about everybody. It felt like it was a whirlwind. Really awesome. And one of the best parts was the 747 carrier that holds the shuttle, just like... 
this here. That's you know, analog of you. I know, but still, I've got it, and it's cool, and I thought it was fun. Anyway, but we got to go inside the 747. We get to tour the plane that holds the shuttle. The shuttle carrier aircraft. It we got to go on board the shuttle carrier aircraft while the shuttle was mounted. It was right on top. top. It was so cool. It was really awesome. And then the, the pilot came and he talked to us, and that was really cool. And he was showing off for us. And we got to see it land at Dryden and take off from Dryden. And it was really amazing. So, this is the first NASA social either one of us, I, I didn't get to go, but either one of us had ever been able yep. to attend because we had normally been media. And we right. had always looked longingly at the NASA social Always. events at the Kennedy Space Center. So did it live up to your expectations? Oh, absolutely. And it was really cool because even the NASA people were like, don't worry, you guys are going to be treated like royalty. And I was <laughs> like, I can attest to that. It was <laughs> right. amazing. So now everyone wants to do a NASA social, right? Yes. Right. So you're excited about NASA social. Yes. What do you do to attend? Because they have all these all over, right? It's not just yep. for Endeavor. It's not just for space shuttles. They've got it for a bunch of, of different launches and, and events and scientific uh, exploration that yep. NASA does. So how do you get involved? How do you be one of the people that goes from an online uh, space geek to an offline, I got to actually do that space Ooh, geek. Ooh, an IRL. An IRL um, space geek. Uh, if you're on Twitter, follow NASA Social on Twitter. I believe it's just NASA Social. Uh, you can hit up nasa.gov slash NASA Social. Uh, there's a ton of information there. They put out feeds on Facebook and Google+. Plus. You can follow them in all of those different places. And they'll let you know. They'll say, hey, you know, some of these you have to be a U.S. citizen, but a lot of them you don't have to be. But this is our next NASA Social. It's going to be for such and such an event. It's a launch or it's not a launch or whatever's going on. I believe they had one for MSL. They had one for the Juno launch. They obviously had one for Endeavor just kind of hanging out. And uh, yeah, no, really definitely do it if you can. Speaking of Endeavor, here's a shot you don't normally see. This is a live shot, uh, unless of course you're watching Space Vcast On Demand. <laughs> For those of you watching this live right now, this is a live shot of Space Shuttle Endeavor as it's making its way from the Los Angeles International Airport, LAX, over to the California Science Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe we're still on Crenshaw Avenue, which interestingly enough is uh, right where SpaceX is right off of Crenshaw as well. Well, uh, Crenshaw they, goes quite a ways in LA. It did. So. They did not pass by SpaceX, no. but they did fly over SpaceX on the uh, flyover. So that is a, uh, a the, if you look at how much clearance they do not have on either side, right? If you look at the right wing, it, mm -hmm. there's like, hardly any clearance by that tree and it's very very stop and go yeah. this entire time it started its journey yesterday and it's uh, it's going to make it i think it's a 12 mile trek yeah and there are some areas where when they're passing by certain things they have clearance but they only literally have clearance of maybe a foot I heard that there was, at the smallest, there was a clearance of one inch on either side. Wow. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of that number. That seems really, really tight clearance. Really, really tiny. But yeah, these, these clearances are incredible. So obviously, yes, they have to be very, very stop and go. Uh, the entire sort of lift contraption thing that they are on is being controlled by one guy that basically has a joystick. Uh, it's it's kind of incredible. The entire story is is absolutely amazing. Now here's a shot from earlier tonight. This is Space Shuttle Endeavor on its lift, uh, and this this is where it's actually going over Highway 405. I'm sorry, I'm from California now. I'm sorry, the, the 405. 405. Uh, so it's this is and it's being pulled by a Toyota Tundra right there. Yeah, you can see that that truck. It's just a regular Tundra. It has not been souped up in any single way other than the word Tundra on the <laughs> side of it, as you can see there. Which I'm pretty sure if you go to the dealer and say, hey, I'd like a giant thing of Tundra on the side. Right. Someone at Toyota would be like, oh, all right, fine. We'll put right. that on there for you. Uh, but which is really, really quite incredible when you think about it. Uh, the, the enormity of this weight is absolutely unbelievable. And I always, I always love these shots because while it is fascinating to see something that we have watched for years go up into space and see it in a quite a quote unquote regular setting, right? It's going across a street But look of at those sorts. people all out at night. Look at the massively huge number of people out there to watch Space Shuttle Endeavor. Isn't that, I think it's really Awesome that we've got this much interest in the space shuttle. Yeah, but I but my other point was though that when it does go across something that's fairly normal and regular, now you can really see how big or how small mm -hmm. the shuttle really sort of is. I think it's it's weird. It almost looks like it's a model, like a really gigantic model, as opposed to this is something that used to go up into space. So all the time. fun comments from the chat room. Uh, Whoa, well, Jeffrey said, it's the most nervous use of a joystick ever, which got me to thinking you better be a pretty good gamer. You're at years of gaming. They bring Carmack in? Uh, exactly, bring Carmack in. 
Uh, and then uh, USKO said it seems like a funeral. I, I don't get that, you know, if I crank up the audio. Oh, well, maybe not. Uh, there was cheering earlier on. Uh, so I, I, I never, I've yet to get the feeling that it's a funeral. There's more of a um, excitement in the air than anything else. I guess I can see what you're saying, sort of the uh, processional, as it were. Um, but it, it... A jazz funeral. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, when the saints... Oh, okay. Um, no, I, I think it's really cool. Uh, Endeavor definitely has uh, purposefully and unpurposefully stopped traffic all over L.A., uh, it's been kind of insane, which I think is really awesome and kind of encouraging. Um, you know that the, that regular folk are kind of getting up onto their onto their roofs, and even babies I saw pictures of, uh, just to get a better shot of the shuttle, just to sort of see it go by. Even if they sort of didn't care at all before, it's still such a a crazy, crazy feat just to get it from those little twelve miles. All right, so uh, Space Shuttle Endeavor is going to make its uh, journey to its new home at the California Science Center, and mm -hmm. then it's going to sit there for several years while they build its new uh, display area. It will be the only space shuttle of the uh, shuttles on display that will be done in a vertical position. Uh, we'll also have two solid rocket boosters, obviously no fuel, and uh, those will actually be uh, real solid, the actual solid uh, segments they're going to be using those and then a faux external tank. Uh, yep. So it'll, it'll look as if it were about to take off. <laughs> exactly. So it's really awesome. All the different shuttles in all the different places are all in different uh, configurations. So uh, one looks like it's kind of, it's doing a drop test. One looks like it just sort of rolled in at wheel stop. Uh, the other one, Atlantis, is going to look like it's in space. And Endeavor is going to look like she's about to fly off, Might which is kind of cool. fun to kind of cool. travel the country and see all of them. Yes, we need to do a shuttle run. So actual vehicles that are working for realsies now. Right, <laughs> things that are still going into space. Uh, Delta IV launched on uh, October, what was it, 4th? Yeah, October yep. 4th, carrying a GPS 2F3 satellite. So here you go, here's some launch coverage. Pick this music. This is Delta Mission Control. T minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. We have ignition of the RS 68 main engine. Two. One, zero, liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying the GPS 2F3 satellite for the United States Air Force. So obviously ULA made those videos. Um, <laughs> don't worry, we're laughing <coughs> at them, not with them. It's like they, they're trying so hard. They think they're being cool because they're adding music to a rocket launch. I don't know, I don't know. It is what it is. Well, it was a cool, regardless, outside of the really cheesy music,
rocket, rocket. Um, outside of the really, really cheesy music, um, uh, it was an awesome, clean launch. So, uh, you know, they are rocket scientists, not video editors. So, good. good Much for them. like a TV commercial, better on silent. <laughs> there you go. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we've got two more rocket launches um, a little L Cross video, our main topic, and viewer comments. Stay with us. We'll be right back. So that's actually way better music for launching to than whatever Much whatever better. that was. So all right, uh, speaking of launches, uh, big huge deal, SpaceX launched the Falcon 9 Flight 4 Really Sierra. big huge deal? I don't know, big they just did one earlier, <laughs> like what's the big whoop at this point? Uh, Falcon 9 Flight 4, CRS-1, the first uh, official commercial resupply mission, um, the COTS mission, the mission prior to this. Um, was a demonstration mission to show that yes, we can actually do this. It's kind of like the test article. Yeah, the this test one's article. the real deal. This was the real deal. So here you go. Here's some uh, launch coverage from Falcon 9 Flight 4. No music. CRS 1, no music. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Falcon 9. Falcon 9 cleared the tower. All Starting pitch take. Full power. Starting gravity turn. JDMTA acquisition of signal. We have a solo telemetry lock on stage one and stage two. First stage propellant utilization is active. Vehicle is on a nominal trajectory at 5 kilometers in altitude, velocity of 230 meters per second, and downrange distance of 700 meters. Vehicle is supersonic. Now, vehicle has reached maximum aerodynamic pressure. We'll talk over this a little bit because this is pretty epic uh, footage, and actually, as we were talking about in the uh, chat room, Whoever got the cameras installed to show both sides of stage separation, that was awesome. So we're actually going to let this go uh, so you can see that particular part of the uh, clip where you can see uh, stage step. And you can actually, on the uh, left and right side, you can see either side of the vehicle. Second stage is starting to it's, chill. It's, it's really, really cool. Um, but about, a, what was it, a minute and 20 seconds after? Uh, yeah, a minute and 19 seconds uh, into the launch, Falcon 9 ro rocket detected uh, what SpaceX is calling an anomaly of the first stage engine. Uh, it did not explode as a lot of people in the media have liked to sort of say happened. Uh, the engine novel. didn't explode. It didn't go crazy go nuts. It didn't have all kinds of things rain down on the people who were there. Um, there was just an anomaly and a shutdown. And most of the stuff that you saw actually being, uh, what's the word I want, sort of uh, ejected as it were. Um, uh, were actually panels that were designed to relieve pressure within the engine bay. Those were ejected to protect the stage and other engines so that, God forbid, nothing else happened. Here's stage step coming up right here. So if you watch the I'm left and right side, one. you can see either side of the stage separation. I think this is a really cool shot. It's, yeah, it's kind of beautiful. Any moment now. Um, they know that the engine did not explode because they still continued to get data from 
uh, all the different sensors and whatnot. So it was just an anomaly and a routine like ejection. The thing is that this particular rocket, I keep saying machine in my head, but this particular rocket is designed in that manner. That's why we have nine engines. We can technically lose two at some point and still be okay. Is that correct? Yeah. Really? Yep, absolutely. That's cool. Uh, oh, uh, there we go. Whoosh. You can see the uh, stage separation right there. And then you can see the engine ignite. Ah, I just thought that was really cool. Yeah, um, Falcon 9 shuts down two of its engines to limit acceleration to 5 Gs, even on a fully nominal flight. Quote, unquote, SpaceX. Oh, yeah, but that doesn't mean that... I mean, I really, I honestly don't know, but that doesn't actually mean that you can lose two engines during the sentence and still make your nominal mission. That means The that rocket could therefore have lost another engine and still completed its mission. Oh, apparently. There you go. Good thing I'm doing this story. Good anyway. Good thing you're doing this story. Um, so that, that's what was going on. Uh, it was, did not negatively affect uh, the flight itself and... and there weren't any humans on board. But a lot of people made a big deal out of it. it a you know. much bigger deal out of it than, than need be. And it's not like this has never happened to any other vehicle. Saturn V also had uh, similar kinds of issues. Uh, yeah. So, But the, the one cool thing I would like to point out personally is that SpaceX is the only uh, company that has a vehicle that could lose an engine and still be okay at what? this point right now. Uh... At least that's what SpaceX told me on their website. Hmm. How's that for an answer? So you couldn't lose a solid on another vehicle. Right. But I wonder, once you've gone past the solids, if you couldn't lose another engine on another vehicle. That I do hmm. not know. I don't know either. All right. Uh, so that was the SpaceX launch. Uh, so, yay. It lost an engine, and obviously everyone made a big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. We mentioned it, mostly because everyone else mentioned it. Uh, but I, I think... Uh, well, to try and help clear some things up. Yeah, maybe. I think SpaceX did a really good job of saying, look, it wasn't a big deal. And um, I think it's funny. They lost an engine mm -hmm. and still made it to uh, Space Station 30 minutes early. That's so. what I'm saying. <laughs> That's the next-gen rocket for you. And still the ice cream didn't melt. The ice cream didn't melt. So there, there you go. There you go. Um, so uh, another launch, uh, just continuing our launchathon as it were. Yeah. Uh, we've got on October twelfth a Soyuz launched uh, carrying Galileo, uh, which is a navigation satellite. So here you go. Here's this launch. Top décollage. As was brought up in the live chat room, it is a little weird watching a Soyuz launch with a countdown in French. That's because while it is a Soyuz uh, Russian rocket, it actually is launched from French Guiana uh, uh, through the European Space Agency, uh, through a partnership they've got there, giving ESA uh, kind of a oh, full range of rockets. Always the Soyuz spectacular. Being their We're medium off. lift rocket, and then they've got Ariane 5 for their heavy lift rocket, and Vega for their Teeny tiny low lift rocket? No lift rocket? I don't know what to call that. Little lift? <laughs> Lack of lift rocket? Petite lift though. No. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, so uh, we've actually got a couple other news stories. We'll, if we have time after the comments, we'll, we'll touch on those. Uh, one of them is from Space Vicast's own Vax Headroom. He did an yeah. L-Cross anniversary video. And we've also had a Sputnik anniversary. And we've got yeah. launch, launch coverage from that. Um, so if we have time, we'll, we'll air those a little bit later We actually on. just wrapped up World Space Week. You should look that up. And we just wrapped up World Space Week. But I did want to, we've only got a few minutes left in this particular segment, but I, I did want to talk about our main topic, which is um, Roscosmos is struggling a little bit. They've had a bunch of failures. Um, they, they're noting that their, legacy, their infrastructure is kind of legacy-driven, mm -hmm. really hasn't been updated that much in the last 20 years. A good chunk of their engineers have just retired or are no longer with us. Right. Um, and, you know, it's... Uh, it's an aging space program with no kind of clear vision forward. I know it sounds a little bit like NASA, actually. Uh, mm. But the question, the main topic is, uh, with Roscosmos struggling, China pushing forward with main flights, ULA increasing the cost of launches, where will the space industry 
B, in the next 10 years, is there a market for startups like SpaceX, Mass and Space Systems, and Armadillo, or are they all doomed to be absorbed by the collective? And I, I think this kind of comes down to Roscosmos looking at the uh, kind of space and going, well, you know, we know we kind of want to be there for pride, but, you know, why? You know, what, what's the point? Interesting. Um, so, well, yeah. they're still bringing stars and billionaires and internet moguls sure. up to space. Yeah, absolutely. But when you when you look, uh, uh, re I don't remember which astronaut, but a recent astronaut uh, who took a trip to the ISS basically had some harsh words to say about the Russian segment, saying when you look mm. at the American segment, it's you know much more spacious, it's much more comfortable. They've got robotic tests. They're doing this really cool stuff with SpaceX and commercial crew. Uh, and you look at the Russian segment, and it's it's really cramped. It's like you get one seventh the living quarters per astronaut than you do on the U.S. side. <laughs> Um, the, That's rough. The, the infrastructure is all legacy. Um, it's all old stuff. We're not doing any cool stuff. We, we've been evaluating robotics for 20 years but haven't actually done anything with it. Mm. Um, so, you know, very harsh comments. And, you know, you kind of, ex oh, well, that's career suicide at that point. But, like, a week or two later, um, <clears throat> Heads of Rose Cosmos kind of came out and said, yeah, no, actually, you know, legacy infrastructure, old-time stuff. We should probably figure this out. <clears throat> so... Hmm. You know, uh, good for him. Kind of, right? Yeah. To be like, yeah, maybe uh, something's up. But then that that begs the question: Where's Rook's Cosmos going? You know, what what if they're having a hard time, and, and NASA's kind of having a hard time too? What's right. NASA's What's NASA's manned mission? Right? Well, mm -hmm. Why we're building SLS, the Senate, uh, Space Launch System, but why? Um, you know, Roscosmos has their rockets, but that was an actual slip up. It's I, fine. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, Roscosmos has their rockets and they've got the ISS, you know, their, their segments on the They're ISS. They're the taxi system right now. They are right now, but where's the whole industry going? Is there enough um, of a market for SpaceX and Mastin and Armadillo and Orbital and all of these commercial companies to actually go in and compete? Hmm. Um, is there enough of you know, and, and or is it just going to end up being like these giant conglomerates like ULA, well, which is basically Boeing and Lockheed? You know, right. It isn't basically. It is Boeing and Lockheed. Uh, right. Well, I, you know, I think the uh, the big guys could possibly. Um, it uh, oddly enough to me, it seems as though the big players have lost the big dreams, and it seems like the smaller players have got the big dreams. Right. Like Elon has said. He wants to go to Mars. He wants to retire on Mars. And while dude's not super old, he's not super young either, which means that this stuff needs to be getting done like yesterday, right? Well, yeah, but you've got so uh, the Lockheed. smaller if the smaller companies are like, oh no, totally, let's go to Mars. You got Lockheed building Orion. Yeah, how's that going? Fairly well. They did some parachute tests. It's very expensive, but you know, it's a deep space exploration vehicle, DSEV. Yes. I made I made a new acronym. Great. Deep Space Exploration Vehicle, a DSEV. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I, I can't, uh, you've got, well, I suppose Sierra Nevada could be considered a uh, um, smaller. Because the only thing I've heard on a NASA other than SLS, mm -hmm. the Space Launch System. You had to think about it. Right. Um, <laughs> was that, uh, you know, eventually they want to have something on the other side of the moon. And, but really the next big sort of thing is we want to land on Europa, or at least try to land on Europa. Well, no, I mean, I mean, ULA has talked about fuel depots uh, near the moon and, and working to kind of use those to expand our civilization to further to like Mars. Okay. And I don't hear anyone else saying stuff like that, but they, you know, talking about using upper stages of rockets to turn into fuel depots. I thought that was kind of cool. All the right. question is, can they actually do it? So uh, that's our question to you. So what is the future going forward 10 years? Don't go too far forward, right? So we need a Star Trek United Federation. United Federation of Planets? Yeah, right? Like, because if everyone's kind of going off and doing their own thing, it's, we may not get very far. Well, you could argue that both ways, I suppose, couldn't you, right? Because it's a lot of wasted effort. Right. But at the same time, if you've got just one giant conglomerate, you're going that one direction and nowhere else. Right. So if you want to go to Mars and they say, nah, we're going to the moon. Well, I don't want a giant conglomerate, but it would be sort of nice Big if you brother. could get some of the bigger players to kind of work together instead of... Isn't that what ULA is? I, I mean, like, <laughs> Russia, China, and the U.S. working ah. together. Well, Russia and the U.S. Those big players. Russia and the U.S. work together, and we've got the International Space Station. All right, fine. I'm, I'm just I'm, saying. 
a glass half full person, I suppose, and you're uh, just a glass half empty. No, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just pointing things out. Yeah. I'm just throwing it out there. Dashing Been locked dreams. in low Earth orbit for thirty that's years. Fine. No, that's cool. So we clearly we know what our opinions are, and uh -huh. we, we're never going to agree. So what are your opinions? You got to leave it on Facebook, <laughs> Google Plus, YouTube, uh, wherever you can. Uh, we love to hear from you guys. And speaking of, we're going to bring up your comments from our last show that was like a month ago. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, but we're going to bring up your viewer comments in the segment coming up uh, right after this next commercial break. Um, and we were talking about that Toyota Tundra, uh, Toyota Tundra that was moving. Uh, yeah, so that's what this break is. It's a little. I thought it was a really well done little commercial on the Tundra. So here you guys go. Uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. moving something that the people of the United States have been watching for years, a national icon. But it's really heavy, and it's also quite big. We've got one shot at this. We put it together, it's gonna to be real, it's gonna be live, it's gonna be in front of a lot of people. We wanna make sure it's gonna work. This is a test. So we've loaded up two heavy haul trailers with giant concrete blocks. 20,000 pounds, 40,000 pounds, 60,000 pounds, 80,000 pounds, and another 10,000 pounds for 90,000 pounds on each trailer. Trailers that weigh 55,000 pounds each. The trailers are supported by a dolly that weighs 15,000 pounds for a total weight of 307,000 pounds. We're demonstrating the actual capacity of a real Tundra. It hasn't been modified, it doesn't have special gears in it, it doesn't have a special transmission. This is the same Toyota Tundra that you would buy off of a lot. Okay, you guys ready? Three, two, one. On October 13th, Live in front of the entire world, the Toyota Tundra will tow the Endeavor on the way to its new home at the California Science Center. I want a Tundra now. <laughs> but I, I only want one that either looks just like the towing one, it mm -hmm. says Tundra on the side of it, mm -hmm. or I want one painted like the space shuttle. That'd be kind of cool. They should have painted, like you were saying in the break, they should have painted the uh, existing Tundra kind of like the space shuttle. So right. It's like a shuttle, towing it's like the shuttle. white on top and black on the Absolutely. bottom. Absolutely. Uh, so, and by the way, they didn't give us any money for that. We just thought it was no, really it was well really done. Cool. We're like, that's really cool. So we aired in the show. Uh, so let's uh, look at some viewer comments from last month's show, basically. Uh, this comes from uh, John... Nine. I have a question since I'm not aware of lawyers' power in the USA democracy constitution. If NASA decides what its mission will be for the next 50 years, something you guys mentioned in the previous episode, who will ask for funding, NASA or the president? Um, actually, I don't think we, I think that may have been a misunderstanding. Uh, NASA doesn't actually necessarily make their own missions. Uh, which is kind of part of the problem. Which is part of the problem. For example, um, that very famous speech from John F. John F. Ken Kennedy, we choose to go to the moon. Uh, the president of the United States then committed NASA to going to the moon in the next uh, 10 years. Yeah, he, he kind of, uh, when he said we, he wasn't really speaking like a whole him and NASA sat down at a table hmm. and had dinner and said, hey, this would be a super awesome idea. It was kind of almost more the royal we, where he was like, you know what I think? This is what I think. So what really happens is uh, the <laughs> the uh, the U.S. politicians basically decide what NASA is going to do, how much money they're going to get to do it, where they're going, and then NASA has to execute on that. Uh, so it would not be NASA deciding any of those things. It would be uh, 
senators, congressmen, and women. And we do have a checks and balance system where somebody can't just say, hey, you know what, we're just going to go up to Jupiter. And somebody else is like, yeah, cool, Jupiter, well, I'll just sign off on that. And then NASA's <laughs> got to like just make that happen. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, there, there are some people who can make suggestions and, and present ideas and what have you. But ultimately, once the decision is made, NASA has to produce. And as, as Ziggur points out, those JFK speeches were pleased. Speeches, by the way, plural. Yes, Not more singular. Than There's one. that one very famous one, but there were a lot more than that. Actually, that's a really interesting story as well. We should talk about that sometime. because um, he um, He actually originally wanted to partner with Russia, not compete against Russia. But um, they were pleased to drum up Senate House support to fund the crazy project, which yep. ultimately was successful. Uh, so this is from C.S. Bauer. Random question, if fuel is such a minor cost for launches, this is something we talked about not that long ago, mm -hmm. and the rockets cost so much to design and build, why do they not make the rockets taller so they can hold more fuel, thus making longer burns, allowing heavier loads, or high altitude orbit? So basically the question is why not just make really big Bigger rockets? rockets. <laughs> uh, well, we, we can, you know, we obviously, to get to the moon we did with the Saturn class rocket. The mm -hmm. thing is, everything has a cost. So you make the top rocket taller and you add more fuel, you've added substantially more weight, not just in the size of the rocket, because mm -hmm. now the rocket itself costs more, but in the fuel. So now you need few, more fuel to carry the extra fuel that you've just brought on board. Right? Yeah. So there's a there's diminishing returns. Right. As Eventually you, there's uh, a tipping point where it doesn't it almost doesn't matter how much more fuel you have because you need in more fuel to you get need the more fuel, fuel for the to fuel get for the, the fuel. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. It start it kind of starts to spiral out of control. And that's why when you look at uh, you know, the Saturn V was a mammothly huge vehicle. And uh, it was you just look at a chart, I wish I had one right now, if you look at a chart, a size chart between like a Saturn V and say a space shuttle or, or current vehicle, <laughs> it's like Saturn it towers v over space them. Shuttle, like it towers over them, but it was only the teeny tiny toppy little itty bitty bitty bit capsule that barely held three grown men. That's the only part that we actually brought back to Earth. The it's, rest of it was essentially fuel or a landing module. Yeah. It's, that's how much it takes. It's so disturbing. Uh, that's why we don't uh, necessarily do that. Um, let's see here. Because at some point it doesn't make sense. C.E. Hussey, I think that is. For pirate space to grow, production is key. What is the present economic viability of mining asteroids? How much thought has been given to smelting and manufacturing off-world? I'll let you guys continue to read that one. Uh, but uh, I, I think... This comes from uh, some of our planetary resources uh, conversations where planetary resources is going out. They're sending out asteroids to, uh, at, they're sending out asteroids. They're sending out satellites to monitor asteroids to see what they can mine. Uh, but realistically, they're looking for water. The economy of space at this point, um, more than anything else, is, is water because you can use water to turn it into rocket fuel. So you'd be able to essentially create fuel depots, uh, you'd be able to explore the solar system, you'd be able to create um, a, a lot of, you know, a lot of, water's very heavy and a lot of the material you need uh, to get to other places can be found in water by separating it out, doing whatever you need to do it. Um, and in this US chaos says we should mine everything but the moon. That's a fun conversation we've had with him. So um, I think that's right now where, uh, companies like Planetary Resources are looking for water. They're not necessarily looking for um, metal, precious metals or anything else on these alien bodies. That's not to say that they couldn't in the future or that they couldn't figure something out. It's just that, you know, that's not what we're doing right now today. I hope that kind of answers the question. I mean, I sort of didn't, but, you know. <laughs> I'm just going to answer this the way I want to answer uh, it. Well, that's how I, it's my show, and I'm going to answer it how I want to answer it. Uh, I got juice 007 says it amazes me that launches get so little I'm sorry get little to no national media coverage. But Kim K, I am so out of it. I don't know who Kim Kardashian. Oh, Kim, that's an M not a Kim. Kim Kardashian gets daily coverage. That is a little bit sad, isn't it? There should be details about the missions and all that. It's so sad. Uh, it, it I, you know, I agree obviously we have a show about space to to cover this stuff. Uh, the only thing I'll say is that uh, space is actually boring. Uh, you know, it's exciting, but it's it's lots of boredom punctu punctuated by just moments of excitement. And Kim Kardashian is just constant crazy. 
And people She's got like a that. team of writers behind her, man, to hmm. keep her interesting is all I'm saying. So I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that the media is going to give you what you're willing to watch. And most people are not willing to watch most space stuff. They're just bored with it. Um, you know, I, I think This Week in Space is a great example of it. It was an amazing, great show done by Miles O'Brien, David Waters, and a, uh, some ex-CNN guys. And um, it's just re really hard to gain traction and the money necessary to make it go because most people just don't care. Obviously, you guys are the exception. It's awesome. That's why we have Space Big Cast. But I think that's why we don't see it in the mass media all that much because space is fundamentally boring. It's On also that, the most though, ex exciting thing ever. Yes. I, I, and there is NASA TV that runs quite literally 24-7. I'm not saying it's necessarily good, but if you want the information <laughs> and you want it through the television specifically, uh, you know, a Roku box, a Boxy box, uh, there's a bunch of other, uh, Apple TV, I think you can get uh, NASA TV via that. Uh, NASA Edge has a Roku channel for sure. Um, you can get it through your cable provider or get it online. And so, yeah, it's not in the regular media, but I, honestly, I don't think it ever will be. So I'm Sorry, but it's not like you can't get the information. Nobody's hiding the information. It just you have to be a little bit more active in searching it out. Rob Holland on our Google Plus channel said, On safety, a profit-making company has a vested interest in being as safe as possible. Heaven forbid that Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, Boeing, etc. have a manned failure. The company, or at least program, would f quickly follow suit. Um, I do agree with that. Um, it depends on timing, of course, right? Uh, you know, airlines have had disasters before and survived, but they're a well-established industry and space isn't yet. And as a culture, we've become very risk averse. So um, at, th at the same time, there are still people who I don't think would care and they just want to go to space. And if it's dangerous, they'll still go. Um, and that's how it will be for the first settlers of Mars for a while. It will be very dangerous. Um, I mean, you saw how the media totally jumped on board or jumped all over uh, the SpaceX engine anomaly. Uh, you know, next thing you know, it was something completely blew up and things totally exploded. And that's not really exactly what happened there. Um, but you get, God forbid, you get loss of life at, at too many things in a row uh, or, you know, too close together. Uh, it's it'll just be the demise of a large portion of our in, of the space industry. I think it could be. It, uh, you know, it, yeah, it dep It's all timing. But yeah, safety is definitely very very important. Um, I think particularly for uh, the the smaller companies. You know, SpaceX is is sort of that weird middle-ish kind of sized company. Um, Virgin Galactic is also kind of middle-ish, uh, as even though Virgin as a whole conglomerate is quite large, uh, so they might be okay. But and I do want to bring up uh, our wiki. Here we go. <laughs> wow, that's teeny tiny, isn't it? Yeah, I was wondering why you were making. <laughs> okay, but there it is. All that just gibberish right there. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. You guys can't read that. Teeny tiny little uh, words. But if you go to our wiki at wiki.spacevidcast.com uh, and then go into episode 5.15, there's a discussion area. And there's actually, USKO is having a discussion with himself. and Because he's awesome like that and he can. Is, he is often awesome like that. And what I would love to have happen is rather than one Space Vidcaster having that discussion, uh, actually have a bunch of people discuss on the wiki some of these points. And I think this is um, uh, a really great, a great place to do it. <laughs> it's really a great it's way really a great to way. get the conversation going. <laughs> so uh, USKO has a lot of really interesting ideas. And here's the brilliant thing with um, uh, Space Vidcasters is some of them are just now getting reinterested in space or just joining kind of the space. So no idea what's going on and just kind of somewhat interested in space. Some of them are actual for realsies rocket scientists who build rockets. And then we've got everyone in between. Everyone and in between. generally speaking, uh, space vidcasters are fairly well behaved. And if you've got a newbie question, feel free to ask it. Because a rocket scientist may answer it for you in plain English, as opposed to a slew of acronyms, which I don't know if you guys know this, uh, we have an on-air no acronym policy. And if we accidentally slip up and use an acronym, we will then stop 
and either explain the acronym or the other person will then explain what the acronym is. At least is. we try. At least we try. <laughs> All right, a couple other things. Uh, speaking of space fit casters that are rocket scientists, Vax Headroom uh, worked on the L-Cross project and that was how many years ago now? Two. Uh, two or three. It, two, three, I want to say. Oh, goodness gracious. Third anniversary. And he released a 30-minute tribute video. I'm not going to air all 30 minutes, we but here's a, quick, here's a quick intro uh, into Vax. This is kind of cool. Remember when NASA bombed the moon? That was the L-Cross mission that occurred October the 9th in 2009. And the room that you see behind me was part of that. This is a remote operations center that we put together for that mission. The video that's going to follow is kind of my tribute to, to that and to my part in that where I was the flight software lead. On the video that you're going to see here in a minute, we actually are showing you a recording that we made of the science and engineering workstation as it was streamed to us here in Lanham, Maryland. The main operations center where that was being executed or where the main mission was being executed and where the science workstation was being operated from uh, by scientist Kim Enico is in NASA Ames uh, on the west coast, on the south side of San Francisco, Moffett Field. So, uh, we'll end it there. Uh, but, it, really cool video. Uh, head over to our wiki, wiki.spacebigcast.com, 515. Um, go into the discussions tab, say some stuff to USKO, so he's not talking alone, we'll do the same. Uh, and then, head on back over to the main page and click on the YouTube link, because all of the entire show rundown, with all of the links to every show, for like the last two years at the very least, some of them, some shows even further back, are all in that wiki. Mm -hmm. So it, like anything you ever wanted to know is inside that wiki. And there's a lot of other space stuff too, like uh, astronaut bios, um, vehicle configurations, there's a lot of really great stuff. Tons and, of stories that we didn't even get to, oh, which yeah. is really oh, unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, but you, can, you can totally see how the show was built uh, using the wiki. And uh, it's a great place to, if you notice there's something missing, start a new space-based article. It's kind of becoming a really great repository mm -hmm. of just space-based information, not just information about Space Vidcast. And I know we're kind of out of time, but I did want to show you uh, on October, what was it, uh, 4th, 1957, Sputnik 1 launched, and here's a quick little video before we go, uh, uh, before we uh, close the show and head into After Dark. Uh, so before I air this, uh, After Dark is our um, uh, epic only subscriber program, mm -hmm. so if you'd like to watch that and you're watching on demand, consider signing up to Space Vidcast Epic. It's what helps pay for the show at spacevidcast.com slash epic. Starts as low as $10 a month, actually it's like $8.33 a month if you do a yearly plan. And not only do you get Space Vidcast After Dark, you also get exclusive content and interviews that no one else gets. It's a lot, it's like gigs and gigs and gigs and gigs and gigs and gigs of exclusive content. Uh, but more importantly, it helps us produce the show. I would say week after week, but uh, you know, uh, we were on hiatus for week, a while. Week, this week, yeah, yeah, whatever. two weeks from now. But it now. helps things go. So on that note, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay with us. After Dark is up next, and we'll see you next week. день весь мир был поражен успехами советской науки и техники. Наша ракета достигла невиданной скорости, около 8 тысяч метров в секунду.